This is anime. Nah, that's not what I had in mind. Show me anime. Now this is what I'm talking about. What you saw before, that's what it used to look like. But it makes you wonder, how did this turn into all this? Well, it all started with this schoolboy writing Katsuro Shashin on a chalkboard. Nobody knows who made him. Poor guy. Cut up paper and you can make cutout animations. But this guy can't cut anything because he's got the dull sword. Whoa, what's that? Oh, it's the Great Kanto Earthquake, destroying the records of anime's existence. That's okay, because we can produce more anime with government funding. And they won't even have to make war propaganda. Fast forward and there are a bunch of new innovations like cell animation and multiplane cameras, improving the fidelity and dynamic nature of anime. Too bad they're so expensive. If only the industry had more. <laughs> Government funding. Here's some money. Okay. You have to make war propaganda. Okay. And so they did. And they made new films like Momotaro, Sacred Sailors, Japan's first feature-length animated film. Breaking news, the war is over. And now we have animated films from the West coming over. Time for artists to gain new inspiration. Meanwhile, anime studios are starting to appear across Japan. Hey look, some guy named Osamu Tezuka started drawing shonen manga. Japan Animated Films was acquired going under the new name Toei Animation. And they just dropped their first major film, Haku Jaden, which is also the first full color anime. Tezuka started his own production company, Mushi Productions, and now they're rivals with Toei. Over there, what's that in the sky? Oh, it's Astro Boy, defining anime style and aesthetic for years to come. Thanks, Tezuka. And over there, that's Tetsujin 28 Go, anime's first mech. These shows are great and all, but everything's all black and white until Kimba the Lion, anime's first full color TV show. And look at that, anime's character details are improving. More anime first, there's Sally the Witch, the first show with a magical girl. And Osomatsu-kun, an early gag anime. It's a shame anime's mostly still in Japan. Racing across the Pacific, Speed Racer became the first anime to be successful in the US. And anime's not just for kids anymore. Dororo just released, targeting adults with more violent and dark imagery. Meanwhile, Tomorrow's Joe is defining sports anime, and Lupin the Third is still active well into the 21st century. Mushi Production has been going through some financial troubles, and Tezuka already left, so it had to close. Out of the ashes comes new studios like Sunrise Productions and Madhouse, and they both seem promising. Go Nagai just released Mazinger Z, the first mech with a pilot. And hey, he just fought Devilman in the anime's first big crossover special. Cutie Honey was a pioneer of ecchi anime, creating the first wave of down bad otaku. Hey look, these two guys are pretty talented. And they just made a show. It's called Heidi, Girl of the Alps. They should keep doing that. In space battleship Yamato just dropped as an epic sci-fi space opera, setting up others to follow suit. Then comes Candy Candy and Space Captain Harlock both becoming popular outside Japan. Capitalizing on the popular space opera genre comes the legendary Mobile Suit Gundam, which flops. But hey, they have some pretty cool toys. Another famous robot, Doraemon, has his show aired that same year, and the kids love it. Miyazaki's making more movies, and this time he's the director. Meanwhile, Rose of Versailles airs, Studio Piero forms, and anime's really hitting the global scene. It's around this time that anime's otaku subculture is beginning to manifest, with shows like Urusei Yatsura gaining popularity. Slowly, anime is starting to look like anime. Meanwhile, Kyoto Animation was just founded, placing an emphasis on good work rather than meeting quotas. They seem like good people. Captain Tsubasa flies onto the scene, creating the blueprint for future sports anime and becoming popular globally. America realizes, wait a minute, this anime stuff has potential. So the Transformers series is animated at a Japanese studio. Creamy Mommy just dropped, popularizing the term magical girl and heavily increasing fans of the genre. Hey look, those two guys are back at it again making movies. This time it's called Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. They seem to have a knack for pushing the boundaries of what's possible in anime. Macross just dropped, mixing sci-fi with idol music. The 80s was considered the golden age of idols after all, but where are the battle anime? Finally, with Fist of the North Star, we get our first martial arts and battle shown in anime. Miyazaki and Takahata make it official, forming Studio Ghibli. Hopefully they can keep making good movies. The Japanese economy is doing well. It's blowing up like a ball or a bubble. Original video animations are really popular. Studios could afford to be experimental and test how well shows would do as a full series. Hey, Ghibli just made their first film, Laputa, Castle in the Sky. Saint Seiya was big in Europe and Latin America. Then Royal Space Force released as Gainax's first film, and Akira was released. It was an extremely high budget film, but it flopped in Japan, stopping the experimental wave of anime. Still, it ended up being a hit in the West and played a big hand in exposing Western audiences to anime. Hideaki Anno released Gunbuster, and that set him up to release another famous mecha anime. 
Ghibli's back with Grave of the Fireflies and My Neighbor Totoro. Boom. The Japanese economic bubble finally burst, putting an end to the high-budget era of the 80s. Still, anime's alive and kicking, with major anime like Sailor Moon, Yu Yu Hakusho, and Dragon Ball Z all airing in the early 90s, solidifying anime tropes and spreading the medium worldwide. Yet, as a whole, the industry is still in decline. Anime needs a big hit, and with Ghost in the Shell releasing, that's exactly what it got. The psychological science fiction, sci-fi if you will, had a huge impact on the types of anime being made, and gave anime more global recognition. Neon Genesis Evangelion released the same year, helping to revive the industry and pushing anime in a more cinematic and artistic direction. It's around this time that digital animation started to see its first usage in the industry. Hopefully nothing awful comes out of that. Studio Ghibli decides to take a risk. It produces an expensive film that was unusually violent for the studio's standards. That film was Princess Mononoke, and it went bonkers crazy in the box office. Whether you know the protagonist as Ash or Satoshi, Pokemon was a huge success and spawned countless movies, series, and specials. By the way, did you like the ending of Evangelion? Because I thought it seemed a little rough. Psych! Turns out Evangelion has another ending, with this movie that people love. Meanwhile, Satoshi Kon was working on his own movie, with his directorial debut of Perfect Blue. Considered not to be far from a perfect 10. Berserk released, Revolutionary Girl Lutena released, and Production IG was formed. Cowboy Bebop dropped, and flopped. Serial Experiments Lane came out too, and it predicted the evolution of the internet. Then Cardcaptor Sakura released, and another studio formed, this time it's Studio Bones, formed from former Sunrise employees. Turns out Pokemon's popularity spawned a bunch of shows, but only Digimon could hang. Yu-Gi-Oh's kinda similar too, but don't get them confused. One Piece started airing around then too, and it'll probably keep airing, forever. Look. Anime's more expressive and experimental now. Enter the new millennia and otaku culture is picking up speed. Love Hina airs popularizing the harem genre and FLCL is giving us polished art and surreal storytelling. Ghibli just released Spirited Away, becoming the most successful Japanese film of all time. That'll never change. And it was also the first anime to win an Oscar for Best Animated Feature. Hey, look at that. Cowboy Bebop is back with a new movie. And the show's airing in the West on Toonami and this time it's a huge hit. Mobile Suit Gundam Seed released the next year along with Canon and Naruto, the show that served as a gateway to anime for an entire generation. I want you to imagine, the year is 2003 and anime are being adapted loosely from the source material. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Full Metal Alchemist is one of these anime. Which side is it? That depends on your level of nostalgia. The big three finally come into form. There's been One Piece, Naruto, and now, Bleach. Otaku culture intensified with the release of Shuffle, popularizing harem and eroge visual novels. Ew. Unless you're into that. Mushishi aired, delivering pure emotion with its episodic episodes. Cable TV just got animeified with the Funimation channel launching. Lucky Star, Haruhi Suzumiya, and a canon remake were popular moe trash, the fans' words, not mine, and pushed that otaku culture worldwide. Some mature and psychological anime release. Paprika, Welcome to the NHK, Death Note, and Code Geass, all in the same year. Gintama's doing his own thing, basically just making fun of all the other anime. Clan Ad After Story released, causing us all to cry our eyes out. And Full Metal Alchemist is back! And what a surprise, brother! It did amazing. Bakemonogatari, the avant-garde shaft anime, was based on a light novel and ended up being iconic. Jun Maeda, creator of Clan Ad and Canon, brought more unbridled emotion to the people with his release of Angel Beats. But even more intense was High School of the Dead. Packed with fan service and high-paced action, it was a smash hit. Hey, this magical girl show seems like a cute- OH MY GOODNESS! OH MY GOODNESS! I guess this is anime's first generational trauma. The sci-fi visual novel adaptation Steins Gate released. Now this has to be the best anime of all time. Another well-loved anime, Hunter Hunter aired and the movie Wolf Children premiered the next year. You die in the game, you die in real life. Sword Art Online. Spawning a whole wave of isekai that definitely hasn't gotten old. SAO is still widely loved to this day. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure finally got a full anime adaptation. Sorry, there's no JoJo reference here. Attack on Titan stomped onto the anime scene and got in a war with Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood for best anime of all time. IQ perfected the sports anime formula, and Your Lie in April released that same year. For some reason, anime studios are bringing back old properties now. Take Dragon Ball Super, for instance. Despite controversies with its animation quality, it was a huge success. One Punch Man aired too, winning over a mainstream audience with great animation and a funny premise. 
Hopefully they can keep this up with a strong second season. My Hero Academia airs, becoming one of this generation's main battle showing. Shinkai's Your Name released too, outselling Spirited Away in the West. Anime is finally starting to become kind of a big deal. And streaming platforms are responding with Amazon, Funimation, Netflix, and Crunchyroll all heavily investing in their anime libraries. For example, Violet Evergarden. Beautifully animated by KyoAni, it was a Netflix original, whatever that means. And a place further than the universe went beyond visuals, being recognized by even the New York Times on its best shows list. One Punch Man got that second season, but the animation wasn't great. Hey look, here's an amazing show. Hopefully this cool new anime will deliver with its second season. And it never got a second season. Overall, anime adaptations from various source materials became really popular this decade. Then Kaguya-sama Love is War aired, rated number one in Japan and solidifying the wave of popular rom-coms to come. And Demon Slayer just dropped too. It's got pretty good animation, but I can't imagine the show being very remarkable. Jujutsu Kaisen airs, taking the anime world by storm, with its beloved overpowered character who ultimately begs the question, can he beat Goku? Demon Slayer returns with a vengeance, releasing the highest grossing anime and Japanese film of all time with Mugen Train. The Korean manhwa Tower of God was adapted into an anime, being the first in a wave of new popular manhwa adaptations. Anime is starting to get pretty huge, with more than 60% of animated shows worldwide being anime, and streaming revenue hitting 5.5 billion USD. But at the same time, the industry artistically stagnated, with new and increasingly convoluted isekai dominating the scene. Still, excellent and innovative stories are still being made. Ranking of Kings aired with a unique art style and storyline. Crunchyroll and Funimation merge. Surely this is a good sign for the streaming industry. And One Piece finally breaks the live adaptation curse, with the first truly good live action version of an anime, while also having a new anime adaptation in the works. Seriously, how is that possible? Oshinoko releases, breaking the internet and idol show conventions with dark drama tones. That same year, news hit that Ash finally became Pokemon Master, and could finally retire at the ripe age of 10. Free Rent Journeys End breaks review sites by putting the typical fantasy show on its head, a sign we're living in the era of breaking the many new and long established tropes of anime. The same year that Hayao Miyazaki won Best Animated Picture again at the Oscars with The Boy and the Heron. I'm sure Isao Takahata would be proud of his longtime partner. Shout out to the many legends that dedicated their lives to creating incredible works, enriching the world with their imaginations, and building the culture of anime. Without them, this video wouldn't exist.